dinner too, probably. And so. Okay. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's my introduction. Uh, let's start clicking through what we're going to talk about. First of all, who am I? Some of you may know me, some of you may not. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me. Next, some diorama theory. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's a very important thing. If you're going to do good dioramas and four vignettes, I'll explain the difference again. You really kind of need to understand some theory behind it. Next, composition. Anytime you're doing a vignette or a diorama, composition is absolutely key. It's the difference between having something going, oh wow, and something that's technically nicely executed but doesn't do much for me. I mean, I'm being brutally honest. And that's one of the things you're gonna hear in this hour is me being brutally honest about you know what I've seen doing dioramas and vignettes, both on the judging and both doing them and lessons I've learned as I've gone along the way. Next. And that's great lead in. Uh, the great thing about our hobby is that we all talk to each other. And if you're a modeler and you don't do that, talk to people. Um, I've gotten some of my best advice right here at AMPS from people just talking about my work. Sometimes they knew I was there and sometimes they didn't know I was there. But that was what was really cool is to get that feedback about how you're doing. Next. Things that kill a diorama. I'm going to talk about my top six things that I see from a judging standpoint and and again, this is only my personal opinions. You may violently disagree with me, but these are the things that I think kill a diorama. Next, making a layout. I'm gonna walk you through making a layout because that's actually one of the most overlooked things uh, that a dioramist or a vignette modeler uh, does not do. And it will save your butt every time if you take the time to do it. Next, making an easy but professional base. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through how to make one. And I think that bases are very important, not just from a practical side of having something to hold on to your model, but it also sets off your work. It can actually enhance your work. Or if it's not done nicely, can really, I think, detract from the work. And all of you guys have judged models probably in here. You know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to teach you how to make a nice one. Now, we're not supposed to judge bases. I get that. But trust me, if, if you spend a year or two on a model, do something that's going to do it justice. Okay? So I'm going to show you how to make one. Next. Tips on hand painting. There were a lot of seminars this weekend on how to do figure painting, uh, different techniques on uh, painting models or what have you. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but I am going to give you a few tricks things that I picked up and learned about my top three things that I use when I'm painting to make sure that I'm going to do a good job. Next. Tips on masonry. I'm going to talk about this just a little bit. Next. Tips on groundwork. And then finally, tips on water. <coughs> Next click, please. Oh yeah. My closing thing Sorry, is inspiring man. dudes. All right. So the, like I said, I've learned from people along the way, and I'm going to talk about some of the people that influenced me as I've been doing my work. Next. So yeah, we're going to talk about all of that. And next slide. So who am I? First click right there. I was a weird kid. Uh, you know, always been a little bit off. A little bit of an introvert. Loved sitting down, doing models ever since I was a kid. I picked it back up again. Uh, when I got back in the Marine Corps, I was in the Marine Corps, and I ended up next to this hobby store that was next to my apartment complex, and it was literally right across the parking lot. And they were like, some months I probably came close to not paying the rent because I was buying crap out of this hobby store every day. <laughs> next, uh, I was a Marine Corps tanker. Uh, I joined in 84, 2004. Uh, I was a tank officer. And that's really kind of what got me interested in armor modeling because it made professional sense for me to do that. Hey, if I got to know all these different tanks out there on the battlefield, why not build them? I started learning, you know, what type of gun they had and how many road wheels. And I started learning about the history. So it just kind of fed upon itself. I get asked this a lot. Hey, Dave, what'd you ride around on? I rode around on M60A1s and M1A1s. So there's some pictures throughout my career. Next click. 
started out on slick slide M60s, then we moved to this reactive armor M60. Uh, that's uh, one that we used during the Gulf. And then finally right here, that's me right there hanging out with my uh, artillery forward observer and my driver, my loader, so my M1A1. So it was a great career, loved it, and love to talk to you offline about that if you got any questions about modeling rink for armor. Next. Been an amp student for about 14 years. So I'm certainly not one of the oldest of the plank owner, owners around here. I try to make every show, and uh, I love coming to talk to you guys. So if you have any questions, please feel free to come up and ask me anytime during the show about, hey Dave, I got a question about this. But anytime during my presentation, next the next click, is we should be constantly teaching and learning from one another. That's what this organization is all about, and that's what I love about AMPS. So I want to thank you for being here to learn a little bit from me, and hopefully I can learn a little bit from you afterwards too. Next. I'm just going to walk you through some of my work that you may have seen here at AMPS, and I'm kind of doing it chronologically here. This is actually one of the first dioramas. This was back at Old Hava de Grace. Uh, I think it was like 2004 Two. or five, somewhere around. Two? No. Maybe it was earlier. That's the first thing I've seen of you. Still the overhead? Pardon me? Mind if I kill the overhead lights? Oh, absolutely. Sure, we can do it. Unless you, you don't need to see me. Uh, leave one on. I mean, it's not Just necessary. leave the front ones on. There we go. Oh, yeah, that's, a lot, that's a lot better. Yeah, go ahead. Kill it. Yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see it. Now, you can see my progression in these two, and you can see the progression of our hobby. You know, this is before the days of all these fancy weathering products we have now and all this chipping stuff going on and all that stuff. But uh, this is where I was first starting to learn the idea of a, of a diorama having a point, having a focal point to direct the viewer of what the story you want to tell. And some of the guys teach me a, a common theme that I have is some animal that's in my diorama. Why do I do that? Well, first of all, it's different. Uh, you know, and I'm going to talk more about being different here later in my seminar. Next. This piece right here, it's another animal. This is desert tortoise, kind of the same theme. But this was uh, <coughs> Cheers to the Faster Panzer. And uh, this was here at AMPS that did well and also did well in the Nationals down in Atlanta for IPMS. Next slide. Uh, this is a larger vignette. This is a 16th scale uh, Hetzer that I did. An absolute god off the model from Cromwell Models. You can even find it. But it's such a bad kit, they don't even give you the bottom of the hull. I had to make the bottom of the hull. I, I couldn't believe that. But anyway, uh, this is a nice little vignette set somewhere along the eastern front late in the war. Next. This is a piece I did. This is actually one of my favorites. Uh, this is Saviors of Saipan. Uh, being a Marine, I'm very close to Marine history. And I read about the ducks actually were a huge benefit to the Marines there. They had a very small beachhead. They couldn't bring boats in. So these ducks would take fresh troops in and they would bring the wounded back out. So I wanted to try and tell that in a story. And so you've got the side of the ship, the scratch built, and it's so big I couldn't even show you the top of the ship here, but you get the idea of what I was trying to do. And this is also where I was starting to expand trying things. Okay, I said I want to start putting different elements into my dioramas. I want to try doing water. So this is the first time I attempted water. So the lesson here is, as you watch this progression is, don't be stuck in a rut with what you keep doing. Keep reading, keep talking to one another, and branch out into different elements. The more elements, the more difficulty you can put in your dioramas, the more satisfaction I think you'll get from it, and it, well, people will just be wowed. If you take those risks and take those chances to do it, hey Dave, yes. Was that? I mean, you played with the water first aside somewhere else before you did that, or did is that you dropped water the first time? Well, there? I'm going to be honest with you, and, and I'm going to talk about it. I okay. did play with the water, so when I talk about water, I'm going to talk about doing that. Cool. But it's still damn scary when you've got <laughs> two years of work sitting in here and you start pouring that water, going, "Oh dear God, I hope I don't screw it up." And just like you, I, I probably, I, for a night, I went, maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe, maybe I just, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I don't want to do this. And I can remember my hand literally like shaking as I was pouring it out going, oh dear God, have it work, have it work. 
and it, and it did, luckily. But if I hadn't taken that risk, I wouldn't have had this diorama. So, and it's actually one of my favorite pieces now in my collection. Next. Uh, this is a piece I did, didn't work so well, surprisingly. Um, I think one thing that people were turned off by it is uh, this, the sand at Tarawa is not yellow, it's white. It's a crushed coral, so it really looks like snow. And it was kind of funny, people didn't know I was standing next to them as they were talking about my piece, and they go, what, there's snow on it, what, what's up with that? So, you know, I kind of went, well, okay, I guess it didn't work, or maybe I should have some, did something different. But I expanded in this piece by trying to do palm trees. So these are my first palm trees. And, you know, I really played around a lot with how to do these things, and uh, afterwards I can explain to you uh, after the seminar how I did those, if you have an interest in those. But uh, that was actually one of the more difficult things to do in this piece. Next. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Flower, Flowers from Angels. And this piece right here uh, is probably my second most favorite piece. Um, I try to always put a bit of emotion somehow into my dioramas. If you can do that, it makes a bigger connection with the people that are viewing it. Um, and it should be, and I try to break it down sometimes to the most simple elements. You know, people love playing with pets. That's one reason why I have animals in my dioramas. Soldiers, Marines, whatever, they find a puppy, oh my God, for like a half hour, you, they, they're just focused on the puppy. Uh, you know, in this case, you've got the liberators coming into this little French village, and these pretty French girls uh, came and gave the liberators flowers. And I wanted to tell a story from the civilian perspective. If you notice, there's more civilians than there are soldiers in here. You don't see that too much in the dioramas that we do. That's one reason why I wanted to do it. I wanted to go, you know, we forget that there were civilians living in these homes that were being fought over and that were having to live through this war. So that gave me the idea and the inspiration for this particular diorama. Next. This is back to a vignette now. This is not necessarily telling a story, but this is a 1 16th scale. This is that bizarre trumpeter kit. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, there are some parts of it that are beautifully engineered, and there are other parts that you go, dear God, did a five-year-old design this? Uh, it's a bizarre kit. But uh, again, I wanted to try bringing a lot of different elements into it. For example, this bridge facade right here is actually uh, from Michaels, they had those little ceramic tiles, and that's tiles. I actually took a Dremel tool and just roughed them up, and then just started laying them like bricks along here. These balusters are from uh, Armand Viardi. Everybody invites some of his stuff. Sweet! Some of the best resin stuff ever. But I took those balusters and made them a little bit different. And that's what you have to do. You have to just kind of visualize something in your head and then just go, all right, what have I got in my boxes that will start to support what I'm after? And then if not, what am I going to spend out there on the floor at AMS? <laughs> Next. Okay, now we're moving up to some of the more recent pieces. This was uh, Fredericksburg last year. Uh, this is really a vignette, but this is that big old giant Carl Morser and uh, did the munition schleppa next to it. And I've got these guys all taking cigarettes, showing photos, and this guy right down here's got a camera. Uh, but this was an attempt to, number one, I just love the Carl Morser, I just think it's cool. But uh, this is actually grass matting. This is not even, uh, this groundwork was a new product and I wanted to try it. And I thought this might be the perfect place to do that. So if you have to do a lot of groundwork, there are ways you can cheat, uh, but I will tell you that just laying the mat out ain't gonna hack it. Uh, if you look at these mats, they, it's a production thing. They come in these sheets, and you'll have grass fibers that are laying crosswise instead of the way they should, like that in the ground. So you gotta go in with tweezers and pick all that stuff out. So if you think you're taking a shortcut, eh, maybe not. I learned that lesson here. Next, uh, this is a place called Distraction, and this is an example of trying to put humor into a diorama. I'll let you be the judge whether I succeeded or not. 
but the idea is that these three German soldiers are distracted by this pretty Italian girl up on the balcony, and meanwhile these two kids have stolen a couple of tomatoes out from in front of where these guys have got it. <coughs> Humor is one of the most difficult things to do uh, because we all have different senses of humor. So if you're after humor in a diorama, boy, I tell you, you've probably taken on one of the toughest things to do because rarely does it work well. Next. Uh, this is the piece I have here uh, this year, and <clears throat> this is uh, a piece called Victory and Contempt, and this was showing uh, the end of the war. Uh, basically, I wanted to show and give a perspective from a prisoner's perspective. So you've got these line of Germans coming through here, and I wanted to have this effect of these Russians basically surrounding on top of them and on the sides, just jeering at them and giving them pretty much a hard time as they were going into captivity. And I love this little Bravo six figure set back here. And I love this guy, he's kicking the crap out of the guy in the back because he's uh, not caught up. All right, so that's some of my work now. And I've kind of explained to you some of my thought process to that. So let me start talking to you about some of the tips and things I've learned as I've gone along. All right, here's the theory part. This is the most boring part of my whole seminar, but it's important. You've got all kinds of definitions of dioramas and vignettes, and different groups have different theories. If you talk to an IPMS guy, he's probably got a different theory than an AMPS guy, who's got a different theory from the guys who go to figure shows, okay? But for AMPS purposes, dioramas have a story and vignettes do not. I can tell you from a judging standpoint, Modelers sometimes make this mistake. They think they have a story and they put it in dioramas when in fact they really have a vignette and they get killed on their scores, okay? And then they get their scores and they're like, son of a bitch, I'm never doing another diorama again. Well, you didn't do a diorama. If you put it in vignettes, you would have been much better off because you had the composition, the technical work, everything, but it didn't tell a story. So how do you know something tells a story? Here's one of the first tips. Ask someone after you do your layout, what do you think is going on here? And if they can't answer it the way you want to impart it to the viewer, you need to change it. You are not successful. But if they look at it and go, oh yeah, that's what this is going on right here. And if they nail it, you're on it. That's your composition. You know who I asked? My wife. My wife will come over because she doesn't care at all about this stuff. She, okay, yeah, you're going to laugh because you guys feelings either. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, she doesn't care about my feelings. She'll tell me right now. She'll go, "That is stupid." You know, I'm like, "Okay, got it. That's going. That's not going to happen right there." And she's been a wonderful source of advice over the years uh, because you know your viewer is all of the people that are going to see it. So. That's a really good thing to do. All right, here's another baby. Diorama, yes sir. So when you write your descriptor, your descriptor sheet for the table, should you mention what the storyline is or you have to be silent? You can, but here's the deal. If you have to explain the story in accompanying paperwork, yeah, you missed it. You missed it. it. It's got to be, it's like being hit over the head with a baseball bat. And people know immediately what's going on there. You know, and and trust me, uh, in the amps, if you take the uh, the judging class for dioramas and vignettes, I have one of the first dioramas I did. I did it in '91, and it, I use it as the bad example, and it's used in the class now. I still laugh; it's still there from about five years. I'm like, yeah, so my work gets pummeled every year. But Dave, if, if yeah. the diorama tells a story and a vignette doesn't tell a story, a vignette can have like a vehicle, you have your whatever it is a jungle or whatever. Absolutely, you don't have to have figures in it? Is that how it goes? You do not have to have <coughs> figures in a vignette or even a diorama, but it has to tell a story. For, let me give you an example. Let me think about this. Okay, if you have a number of uh, Germans, let's say just on the back of the tank, and they're nicely composed, <coughs> but they're just staring off into space together, is that a story? No. Okay? Now, you take the same group of Germans that are on the back of this tank, and you've got one guy who's hit, bleeding to death, you've got a corpsman working on him, you've got all these bloody bandages around, 
you've got uh, all this focused effort on to, to try to save this one German soldier on the back. Do you have a story? Probably do. Okay, that's the difference. There's usually some sort of action in a diorama that is going to convey the story. If you have in a diorama a bunch of static figures standing, that's not working because there's no sense of motion of what's going on there. Does that make sense? Can I answer the question? Okay. All right. So for both good dioramas and vignettes, you also have to draw the viewer's eye. That's what you're after, is they shouldn't have to wander all over your piece going, I don't get what's going on here. They almost intuitively, the way you design it, will put their eyes exactly where you want it. And there's a number of ways to do this, but the way to think of it is like a three-dimensional painting. Look at the front of your piece that you're working or designing and say, what would this look like in a painting? If, I, if this was ha hanging in a museum and somebody just took a picture of it, would they understand it? Does it have good balance? And I know some of you took some basic art classes back in high school, so I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I am here going to pull up a couple of slides straight from the AMPS judging class to explain to you what judges look for. But composition is the most important thing, and I will talk about that next. This is right out of the AMP slide. This is the AMP slide that we talk about. And we say, first of all, there's a set of rules. So the cautionary tale is, I'm going to tell you about some things that work in dioramas and vignettes, but I will tell you that they are only guides. There are some dioramas and vignettes that purposely violate good composition rules to tell the story. And sometimes it works, but it's a risk. All right. So if it works, it works. That's the deal. That's why I always ask my wife, what do you think is going on here? And if she smiles and she says she gets it, I know it's working. Uh, if she doesn't do that, then I may have to go back and rethink it. But <clears throat> the other thing that I want to tell you is that do what you love. Do what you feel here you want to tell in the story. Because I will tell you that my pieces have been at shows and I've done shitty and I've done awesome with the exact same diorama and the exact same vignette. It, I didn't change a thing to it. So what does that tell you? It's in the eye of the order. It's That's subjective. right. Subjective. It's in the eye. Storyline composition are subjective assessment by the judges. I don't want anyone in here to get discouraged if you don't get a good score and you don't do as well as maybe you did when you were just <coughs> building tanks. It's First of all, it's part of the learning curve. But second of all is, just like when you go to shows with your tanks and they get judged, you get different teams. And you know maybe you caught them on the end of a ship and they're having a really bad day. I don't know, but it happens to me too. <laughs> so what I want to tell you is, don't get discouraged by that. Continue to build, continue to take those risks. Now, there's principles and concepts that can help us. And I could spend a whole hour just talking about those design concepts, but I'm only going to talk about one that is probably the strongest way you can compose your dioramas, and it's used over and over and over again, and you probably not even realized it. Next slide. The principles of composition, are these are the four things that you can use to help tell your story, and you have to do it well. Emphasis, and when you're doing your diorama, Copy this slide off and stick it right on your freaking model bench and look at it. Because if you can do these things, you got a winner. Emphasis, a clear single main idea. When they look at your diorama, is it, okay, I get it. There's a clear thing going on here. Or do they go, okay, I see this here, but I don't understand what these three guys over here have to do with these two over here. If they start doing that, you don't have an emphasis. Harmony means, does everything work together? Do you have one figure in there that is weirdly out of place with the others? For example, if you're looking at a vignette and you've got all these Germans that are hanging out and they're all in the back of a tank and they're all got this haggard, weird, you know, tired look like this, but then there's one guy in the back going, 
Does that make any sense? It, it, well, maybe it does, depending on what your story is, but probably not, okay? So even in dioramas, when you're telling a story, things like what the, the expression is on your figures <laughs> have a huge impact on the story you're telling and the mood you're trying to set. Is it a solemn mood? Is it a cheerful mood? Is it an angry mood? Wh what is it emotionally you're trying to share? Unity. Nothing is distracting. Uh, this goes not only for figures, but for the way things are arranged. That can happen also. And I'm not going to talk too much on that, because I think you guys can intuitively know what I'm talking about. Opposition. You can use a lot of things that don't have to deal with placement to direct the viewer's eyes. Let me give you an example. You remember that piece, piece flowers from angels? If you go back and you look at that, piece of mine, what I purposely did is use color to help direct the viewer's eyes. And civilians are a great way to do that because they don't wear olive drab and camouflage, do they? So the three girls that are holding the flowers, first of all, those flowers help direct them. Like, boom, there's red and yellow right in the middle of that diorama. But I also purposely put those girls in very light pastel colors, white, uh, sky blue, what have you. It's a focus point of color right in the middle of all of these earth tones in the entire diorama. So there's an example of how you can use color to do that. All right, next slide. So back to my slides here. We're out of the amp slides now. I told you about good composition. There are plenty of books about composition. And there are whole art majors done on nothing but composition. But I'm only going to talk about five minutes about it. But probably one of the most important things is this right here. Triangles are extremely effective in dioramas. <coughs> now, I'm going to just call them triangles. There are many artsy terms for it and flowery things, but I'm a, I'm a marine tanker, so I speak in small words. This is probably the most obvious example. Here's a historical picture of it actually occurring. Uh, and then there's a modeler who replicated almost the exact same thing. And obviously, you can see a triangle there, right? All right. But let's take some pieces where it may not jump out at you, but intuitively, your mind is looking at a triangle. Next slide, or next click. OK, there is a wonderful piece by John Rosengrant, one of my heroes, probably one of the best sculptors and, uh, I think, dioramist around uh, on the rare occasion he does one. But here you have an action scene, some guys coming around the side of a tank, this guy on the machine gun, this guy uh, obviously in the action also. <coughs> All the action is focused off of the a piece away here, but everything is coming right here. But boom, hit that. There's your triangle. It focuses <laughs> you to look at where you want the action and, the pe and your viewer to look at the eye. There's another interesting point about triangles too. We as Americans, and there's some theory on this, tend to read from left to right, correct? We don't read like the Chinese or the Japanese, whatever. Our eyes naturally focus to the left and move right. Left to right, right where the action is going. So, John understands this intuitively as an artist, and he, he, he doesn't even really have to think about it, I guess, you know, because he just does fantastic work like this. Next slide, next, next click. All right, now here's a vignette, and we got some Germans hanging out on the back here. There's not really a story there, is there? There's a mood, it's winter, they're cold, they're kind of beat, but boom. There's a triangle. There it is again. So you see that occurring? And if you go out on the floor and you look at those vignettes and dioramas, particularly in advance, a lot of the modelers will do this. Now, sometimes the triangle is not vertical. It's this way. And I'll show you some examples. Next slide. There's my piece I did with the Carl Morser. Hit the click. There's the triangle. Okay. And I could go into about how in the <coughs> corners you have this opposition and different weights and all that stuff, but you can read about that for yourself. But the visual impact is this triangle. Hit it again. 
Here's the piece I have here this year. Do you see it? Hit it. There it is. Now, you don't want to be ridiculous about the composition and put everything in exact straight lines. That will not look right. You, you can see how it, it's kind of maybe a little jagged line going this way and a little jagged line going that way. But, <clears throat> but that's what you're after. So any questions about this? All right. Cool. Great advice I got along the way. I'm going to tell you about some modelers I talked to over the years, and I respect them immensely. And let's hit the first one. Visualize the entire scene and sketch it out on paper. Everybody remembers that old Chef Payne book on dioramas, right? Maybe some of you started out modeling looking at that. There is still advice that holds up true to this day. He's the grandfather of our hobby, and, and we still apply a lot of the things that he learned. Next. Learn this from Greg Chilar. Greg Chilar, in fact, has got some pieces here. They're always amazing and wowing. And I had a, a talk with him, matter of fact, last time we were here at Auburn. And Greg, we were talking about how to do a layout. And it wasn't even really a layout. He just said, I just said, how do you get such amazing composition? And he said, one of the biggest mistakes that modelers make is that they try to fit the scene to a base instead of trying to have the base fit your story. So a lot of guys will start out, they've got a big base like this, and then they try to fill it out with things, you know? And, and they're like, oh boy, I need to put something over there. So they put a tree over there. And then they might put some bushes over here. They're trying to fill out that base. Greg says, I don't do that. What Greg does, and that's what I do, is he will place his story on a board, put whatever he wants, only the things that are going to support his story. And then he cuts out everything around it, and he customizes his base. He doesn't care about prefabricated bases. He makes his own, and I do that now too. Because that way you're ensured that everything you want in there and nothing but what you want in there is going to be on your diorama or vignette. So you don't have to worry about filling things in with stuff that may or may not work in telling your story. That's pretty simple, but it was a pretty amazing piece of advice that I went, why in the hell did I even think about that? I used to go down to my basement and go, well, I got this base, this size, that might work. And no, that's not the way you want to do it. Next piece there, uh, Pete. Make the story something unique. Anybody know Doug Lee? Mm -hmm. yes. You've seen him at the shows? Super hell of a nice guy. Uh, from Korea, I think he was living in Canada. I'm not sure where he is now. Back to Korea. Back to Korea. Back to Korea? Okay. He is, uh, I, first time I saw his work, I said, wow, this guy is really different. He's an amazing sculptor, but with his dioramas, he talked to me and he said, you know, you always should look for something that other people haven't done because that's what makes you stand out. And actually, it was one of the reasons he came and talked to me. He, he saw this piece I did, Cheers of the Bastard Panzer, which I, you know, I thought was a little cute little diorama. But he goes, you did something different. He goes, I had never seen a piece where these soldiers were actually just looking at this desert tortoise and just enjoying that. And he was talking to me about how he remembers being out in the field and because uh, he was in the military also and seeing this kind of interaction with the soldiers. And if you look at his pieces, his pieces are really unique. Like, have you ever seen the piece where uh, the Russians are coming into Berlin and the zoo, yeah. and all the zoo animals come You all remember that, don't you? Did you hear that? Everybody went, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Because it was so unique. Nobody had ever done anything like that. And it's based on a historical fact that happened uh, in Berlin. So recognize what you just heard in this room. When, so if you can nail a story that nobody has done, you really are on to something. Yeah, Dave, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. Yes, it was actually one of the most prolific pieces I've ever seen. The first time when I seen him bring it to Chicago to enter it for the first show, his jaw dropping. I mean, 100% jaw dropping. Yeah. 
Yeah, it really is. He's the shame he's out of modeling now. Is he? Yeah, he's in the airsoft. Oh, man, that's a shame. <laughs> that's really bad. But Doug's a great guy. N next one, please. All right. Well, you just heard from one of the guys who taught me back there, uh, Chris Morosco. I've known Chris uh, for well over 20 years now. I think we decided yesterday 24. it was 24 years yeah. we've known each other. And Chris is the guy who started me out. And, and he was kind of my tutor. Uh, he's a brutal tutor. If you don't do things right, he'll curse at you and say, what in the hell are you doing? It's actually more And vocal. Dave even shot super glue on my eyeball on Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> That's another story. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, what Chris taught me was this, and we tend to do this. We are in our comfort zone. We've all started out, we start building just models, right? And I thought, hey, if I just build a good tank and I put some figures around it, okay, I'm pretty happy with that. And he's like, why are you doing that? And he said to me, a rifle sling is just as important as building a tank. And he said that to me 23 years ago, and I still haven't forgot it, because when I'm working on rifle slings, I can hear Chris's voice telling me the same thing. You know? And, and that's just it. When you're doing your work on your diorama, it has to be the same skill level that you do your tanks. You cannot have your figures and groundwork be an afterthought and rush through it and get it done. And I, I see that mistake. I can look at a piece and sometimes tell that. Because I'll know, you know, we all know each other. We've known each other for a number of years. Uh, but sometimes if I know a guy, I'll go, he rushed this right here. Because I know he's, he's better at doing these figures than he did. Next. Hey, Dave. And, that, and that's why I created the wedgie, to be honest. You know, because you can put so much more detail in a slice of life than you can with the whole diorama, the tank, the figures, because people a lot of times just walk by that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I learned this from Bill Chilstrom. Use humor and drama in good taste. That's very important. Uh, you know, I've seen pieces where, you know, they want to have, you know, soldiers urinating off bridges and everything. Trust me, if it's crude, it's probably already been done. And it's usually not done very well. Uh, so what I tell you is use, use the approach that uh, Hitchcock used to use in his movies. Remember the psycho? You know, that still scares the hell out of people. But if you notice in the, in the movie, the girl never gets shown getting stabbed. But you know she did. And you know that she got killed in that movie. And it scares the hell out of you every time knowing that that shadow's on the other side. You use that same kind of approach to dioramas and vignettes. You know, you don't have to spell it out in blood and guts. You can do it in more effective ways than that, and it will make it different. Next. Okay, <laughs> these are my diorama killers, my top six that I think will kill it. And when I see it, I go, kill it, kill it with fire, because I can't stand seeing it, because I just see such great work just being <laughs> squandered by doing these things. First thing, big ass dioramas <laughs> with tons of dead space. And what I'm talking about is this. There's looking at from the top, right? You got a tank sitting here. Maybe you got some soldiers hanging around here. And absolutely nothing happening over here. Nothing. Why go through the work to do all this groundwork and everything over here if it's not telling your story? Cut it down. Make it as, as compact as you possibly can to tell your story because it will focus your viewer. Now, we were having this discussion today, and I will tell you that sometimes dead space is not necessarily bad. You take the same composition, got all this dead space. Let's say it's a desert. Suddenly, you know, this is pretty bad trying to do this upside down, but you draw that. Let's say you spray paint a dark shadow onto that dead space, and the figures are looking up. Did that change the dead space? <laughs> yeah. You bet your ass it did. All of a sudden, that's a shadow of a plane 
and you've now connected it to those figures in the corner. It's a space shuttle. It's a space shuttle. It's a shark. It's a shark with friggin' laser beams, baby. That's what that is. All right. But that, that's the point. You have to think about that space around your main subject of what you're doing. And if it doesn't support it, then forget it. Get rid of it. Next. All right, here we go again. Big ass dioramas with unfocused or unrealistic action. I am not a big, personally, a big fan of shoot 'em up dioramas because they get too chaotic. There's too much going on. You know, there's a guy getting hit over here, then there's some guy over here around the corner, then you got two other guys over here doing this. It's, for me, not my cup of tea. And again, this is only my own personal opinions. I have seen beautiful technical work in big pieces like this, but it doesn't, it, it's much harder to tell a story. And very few guys can pull it off. A lot of guys think, if I just get a sheet of plywood and I build models on it for four years and play some figures, that's a show winner right there. It is not a show winner. As a matter of fact, the larger you get, the harder it is to tell that story and make it all fit, make it all harmonize, all those things I told you about. So if you're starting out dioramas, focus on small. Small, small, small. You get a little bit more better at it, go a little bit bigger, okay? But always pay attention to your story. Next. I, this boggles me, but you guys will spend, some of you, four years on a, on a model and you'll stick it on a Michael's clearing picture frame. Hey. Okay. <laughs> That's right. It's a great feeling. It's but, a trophy, dude. Are you kidding me? I, I, I told you I was going to be brutally honest here. The thing is, is guys, you are all artists. Be proud of your work and put it on something that you're proud to display. It. And personally, it, I would I just cringe like when we're judging tanks and there's not even a base and I've got to pick somebody's tank up and it's so gorgeous looking I, I just want to go oh god I don't know if I can do this you know and you pick it up so that's another thing that the base allows you to do next Popeye figures I'm going to talk about this that is a killer 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 I don't care if you've got one figure or if you think you've got 20 and nobody's going to notice trust me if you got Popeye figures judges are going to notice. Next. Grass, it looks like hair plugs. <laughs> wow. Okay, we're going to talk about grass too, so I'm not going to spend too much on this. Uh, is that six? I can't count. One, two, three, four, five. There's one more. Lichen, lichen, <laughs> lichen. And lichen. I hate lichen. In 135th scale, it doesn't work well. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Lichen? You know what lichen is. It doesn't work I don't like it like it. Today. It doesn't work in eco trains either. It doesn't work for anything. Yeah. I, 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 you know, it's that spongy it's like stuff. You know, I, it looks like a loofah pad. And to be like, you know, your, your daughter's loofah pad got loose on your diorama. Uh, I'm just not a fan of it. And with all the materials that are available to us as modelers now, 20 years ago, we didn't have much. But now we do. We, we have a lot of interesting materials, a lot of them natural that, I don't know where the hell they came from in nature, but sometimes I'm looking at these bags going, I don't know what that is, but it looks really cool. Probably give me cancer in 10 years, but in any case, um, don't use like it. Next. All right, now this is the layout. This is how I do my layout. So what I start doing is I start getting all the elements together on my diorama and I start building these figures. And I have a sheet of uh, small wood at home, about this size. And I start laying everything out the way I want it. Now, what I'll do when I lay them out is you go, Dave, all right, do you glue all your figures in where you want them? No, I don't. What you're going to use is this stuff. Wait a minute. I uh, click a few times there, Pete. Yeah, yeah, this is where you're going to stage your scene. Next one. You're going to hold everything in place. What I use is this stuff called Baird's Tacky Wax. Next click. That's what it looks like. It comes in this little black uh, tub. And it's, I hate to say it, it's like clear snot. You know, you take the little ball out, roll it up, stick it on the bottom of your figure's foot, and that figure will hold and stay on your layout until you get everything laid out. That's exactly how these figures are laid out right here. 
So this is where I start to visualize the whole scene. So once I've got the whole layout done, that I think is going to tell my story, yep, looks fine to me. <laughs> this is where I made a huge mistake the first time I did a big diorama. Hit it again. Take a picture when you've laid it out. I got done with a big diorama, and I forgot to do that, and I got them all discombobulated all over my work area, and I went, crap, I cannot remember how they go all together. And it just, I, I had to start the layout all over again. So take a picture, and go back to that picture. I, I keep these on my iPad, and sometimes when I'm working, I will just go back and look at the original layout and go, yeah, I got that. But sometimes what you'll find, when you take a picture, you notice stuff that you go, oh, oh, I didn't think about that right there. See these two people over there? They're not in my diorama anymore. I, I thought they would work, but they were too distracting from what I wanted, which was the viewer's attention right here. So they were gone. So the pictures can tell you a lot after you do your layout. So what's great about this is I haven't invested any time yet to be done. Right? So I can change this around as much as I want, and I haven't lost all that working time, or throw out figures that I've already painted up, and I go, well, that's not working, but it's already painted, and I spent a day or two painting it. So it's a lesson. Next. All right, now I'm going to talk to you about a base. Oh, man, I need to rush through this. Okay, this is how I make bases. It is not complicated at all. All you're going to need is this stuff right here. This is going to be available on the slides. As a matter of fact, thanks to Pete Gay, he is going to, in fact, put these all out there on the AMP's YouTube site. So you don't need to copy this all down. I'm going to pass this around. But this is how simple the base is. There's the corner of it. It's not the complete thing. But as I walk you through, you can see how I did it. It's not hard at all. And this is, in fact, the base for the piece I have here at AMPS uh, this year. So you can go back and look at my piece, and if you hate my base, you go, what, Vickers, he sucks. Then fine. That's okay. But <laughs> this is what I use. Next. This is the deal. If you spent so long on your model, please make a base. Respect your art and do it, because it's going to allow you to do a couple of things. First of all, safely move it especially if you've got other people, like judges, handling your work. But it also provides, uh, the way I do them, if you want to do acrylic base or acrylic cover, you can have those made for you, and you can get, keep all the dust off of your pieces. So uh, that's another reason you probably might want to make them like this. That's my preference. Next. So how do you do it? Here's the side of it right here. And again, I'm passing out an example. You've got uh, oak that's here, some cheap wood in the center of it, some plywood, and then balsa board and groundwork. And I'll walk you through the steps on the left here. First step, hit it. You're going to take your layout that you made. Let's say I've got my scene. I will take blue tape on my board and do this. And then I will measure it. That's the inside distance right here. So that's my scene. I cut the oak pieces around it at a 45 degree angle, then I do this. I nail them and glue them. It ain't that hard. I got a nail gun. Pop, 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 pop. The frame is done. So now you got something that looks like a picture frame. Next. You hit this. Keep hitting it, Pete. On the inside down at the bottom, I'm going to take cheap pine, flush with the bottom of the frame. And you can see that as I pass it around. That's going to provide a base for the plywood to be glued onto for the center. That's the next. See how this is going? Then I've got this stuff called balsa board. Everybody ever use this stuff? Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's, it's a little expensive, but what I like about it is very light. You can carve it. So in your groundwork, if you have to go very deep, like making a gully or what have you, you can just carve it right out very, very easily with an X-Acto knife or whatever sharp tools you have at your bench. But I'm going to leave a little gap right here between the foam board and the edge because I'm going to put uh, basswood, and that's going to support my groundwork. Next. Yeah, so there's the basswood going in. And then 
you just fill in your groundwork and then what you do with the basswood that comes up over the top edge of your frame is you simply take your exacto knife and carve it following the contours of the groundwork it's that simple does anybody think that's difficult okay all right next let's talk about painting i gotta wrap this up here in about 15 20 minutes these are three things over the years that i didn't think i need well, I can tell you sure as shit, I really need that right now, as you can mm. tell wearing glasses. But paint brushes are key, and so is this strange little thing right here. Let's talk about them in detail. First slide, next slide. Optivisors. There are a lot of vision aids that we have in our hobby. <clears throat> Me personally, I only use an optivisor. The reason why is it's glass. A lot of the cheaper knockoffs are what? What happens to plastic, guys? Scratches. I've got the same optivisor I had when I started the hobby 24 years ago. Now, I have other ones, but when my eyes were better, but now that they're worse, I have newer ones. Uh, but they still work, and it works great, and there's no scratches on them. This is my optivisor. When you're, this, this is my optivisor. There are many like it, but this yeah, is mine. No, unfortunately, Dave, the new ones the really good. The new ones are, are now plastic? Yeah. Well, that really sucks. All right, well, go find an old one or yeah, mug me in the parking lot and get mine. But the thing is, is when you're painting in very, very small, tiny areas, you've got to have the best vision possible. Now, granted, we're, when you're at a show, and usually viewers that are looking at your piece are only seeing things with the naked eye. But if you've got it right with an optivisor on, nobody's going to catch it with the naked eye unless they got really good eyes. <clears throat> All right, next. Brushes, what do I use? I use, for all my fine detail work and for figure painting, Winsor & Newton Series 7 brushes from England. This is my preference. Many, many of the top figure painters use these. Now, there are some that use some other ones. But I will tell you, consistency-wise, these things are the bomb. One thing that makes them so great is they hold a point if you're trying to paint an eyeball in 135th scale, you have got to have a brush that holds a point. I don't care how good a painter you are, if you're holding the wrong tool, you're never going to do it. So I bit the bullet and have over the years and got these Series 7 brushes. They're anywhere from about 15 to 20 bucks a piece. So they're not cheap. These are the most popular sizes for figure painters of what we do. But if you take care of them, they should last you at least 10 years. So one of the things that I always do as a last step is there's this wonderful stuff called uh, the Master's Brush Cleaner. And I will take some water and run it around in there. And you can see the acrylic just fall off the bristles, even after you think you've cleaned your brush. And the other thing that this stuff does is it has kind of a film on it. You don't want to take it all off. You leave a little bit on there. And what it does is it, it stiffens your bristles and it holds it into that sharp point. So when it dries, it's ready to go again, just like a new brush. And it's not that expensive. This is like maybe four bucks a, a tin and a, it'll last you five, 10 years. So well worth the investment. Blick Art Store, that's where I get my Series 7s from. They're, these are getting harder brushes to find, but you can get them online and they can mail them to you. And they usually have sales running about every six months or so, and you can get them at a really good price. Yeah, you won't find them at Michael's. No, you, you, yeah. 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 yeah, or the Jesus. Store. You're only gonna find these in fine art stores. You're not gonna find these at run mill Michael's. Next. Okay, uh, some painters like this, some don't. I like this. Uh, when Bill Chilstrom was giving me some classes, uh, he said, hey, what, what, what the hell? You don't have one of these things? And this is what they are, Masterson, Stay Wet palette, and it's kind of a trademark thing of theirs. And the way it works is there's a tray, you put water in it, and then there's a sponge, and then there's a special paper that they have. It's like a porous paper. You put it over the sponge, and then you're, we most of us paint with acrylics now, I assume. That's kind of the rage, you know? But the acrylics, you just squeeze out a little bit onto that Stay Wet palette, and those paints will stay wet for a day instead of five minutes, okay? If you've just have been taking your acrylics and, and just squeezing them out on a, you know, a piece of paper or something, they dry in what? 
couple minutes, right? They start getting goopy, and those paints will stay just fine on that stay wet palette. You can also thin your paints down on the stay wet palette. Just dip your brush in water, run around the paint, and you can get as thin as you want. And this white paper, you, you can tell the consistency of the paint by how watery it is. You can see it very clearly against that white paper. So I highly recommend one of these. Another little trick I give you is if you do give these, follow the instructions. Because if you don't follow the instructions, because it tells you to boil the paper, it's not going to work right. But you boil the paper, let it cool off, put it in there, and it'll work. And you can take the paint and scrape it off with a uh, scalpel or whatever off the paper, and you can reuse it over and over again. It works great, and it'll save you a lot of money when you're doing your paints. Because let's face it, guys, those bottles are getting expensive, aren't they? So, good tip. Next. Paints I use, Vallejo. Why? Um, they're quite readily available. <clears throat> it's not the only paints I use, but the majority of the time I do use these. They come in a wide range of, range of colors, and you can thin them down, and they have fantastic pigments in them. Really awesome for doing all of your brush work. Some other things that I'd recommend is AK MIG. Andrea and a very very small company called Reaper Paints. I think they're out in somewhere in the southwest, Texas or whatever. Yeah. They're hard to find, but they're very very good paints too. Next, here's a little tip from me to you. One of the biggest problems with Vallejos, and this happened to me too, is they leave a little bit of shine or sheen to them just straight out of the bottle. Some don't, some are flat, but if you take just your brush and you dip it into this flat base and you mix it in on your palette with your paint, they dry dead flat. No problem. And of course we want dead flat colors if we're doing uniforms or something like that. Yes? Yeah, two or three drops of the entire bottle of Vallejo you think or just? Well what I'll do is I will uh, squeeze out the color I need onto my stay wet palette yeah. and then I'll dip my brush in the flat base and then go back in to what I put onto the stay wet palette. Okay. So two or three drops with a, a drop about that big of your paint. Okay, gotcha. okay. any other questions? Next. These seem to be the three books that lately I go back to as far as color combinations. Uh, this book on the left is by Brett Advance. Uh, it was put out by BLS. I still don't know if it's available. I, I've seen it on sale from Squadron uh, from time to time. They may have some leftover copies. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not too much of a fan of, of, of Brett's painting technique, but what I do like about the book is he's very clear about what specific layout of colors to use. And he gives you the number, and then he gives you the color. And it's for the type of painting that we kind of do as ants, which is 20th century stuff. I mean, the guys here, we, we, we don't do Napoleonic soldiers or Roman legionnaires stuff like that. Well, maybe you do, but it's another part of your hobby. But for all of us here, we care about the colors that soldiers wear during the 20th century and the 21st century. This book is the bomb. Uh, what I really love about this book <coughs> is there are very simple charts in it of uh, German uniform camouflage, whatever. And there's a picture of the guy, and then there's the chart. Here's the base color, here's the first highlight, here's the second highlight, here's the first shadow, the second shadow. And I'll show you how to do it. If I had to pick one book right now that I'd recommend to you, if you're starting to do figures and acrylics, it's that right there. It's, it's really an awesome book. This right here is also very good. We, we all do a lot of German tankers. This is really good as far as uniforms go and painting German tankers. <coughs> one of the hardest things to do in figure painting is to paint blacks. Now I know that sounds ridiculous, but if you want to have a black uniform be highlighted and shaded without it looking gray, that's hard to do. So this book does a great job of explaining some different techniques of how to make black uniforms appear realistic in your dioramas. Next. I told you I'd talk about eyes. These right over here are pop eyes. Eyes on dioramas are not circles. You don't look at the eyeball and go, dot, dot. <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing that, you are wrong, okay? Eyes are wedges. 
they're, they're, uh, they're almost a line more than a circle. So, and I could spend a lot of time talking about eyes. And I will tell you, I get it. Eyes are one of the hardest things to do, especially in 135th scale. But what I'm telling you not to do is this right here. And when you paint an eye, if it's looking straight at you, most of the iris will be shoved up into the upper eyelid. Do you notice that? That's another mistake people make. They, they think that the iris is centered here. It's really not. It almost just touches the low, lower eyelid. And I see that a lot. Just look at people's faces or photographs. You can figure this out very quickly. But it's actually one of the most violated things I see on figures. Any questions about that? Next. OK. I, this freaks me out, too. I know when we're painting our, our tanks, we hold them, we paint them. And a lot of folks think that same rule applies when they're painting figures. Never, ever handle your figures while you're painting them. First of all, you're going to get the oil from your fingers all over them, and you're going to start getting a sheen onto those uniforms. So you always want to mount them. It's not that difficult. This is nothing more than a couple of drops of super glow and some accelerator and sticking them right onto the base. And usually I can just snap him right off after I'm done. Always grab them down by the feet though, I do. Now when I do grab a figure, yeah, you know what, one-legged guy. Uh, but when you grab the figure, never by your hands. I always put, I have a set of latex gloves or a box of those, no jokes, all right? Thank you. But I will put those latex gloves on, and that's the only time I will ever handle a figure. And it's usually when I'm done painting and I'm ready to put them into the scene. Any question about that? And you, this is my workbench right here with me working on the, the piece I have here this year. Oh, yeah. Prime your figures. That's another thing. You've got to give something for those Vallejo paints to bite into. Now, there's different modelers will recommend different primers. Uh, it's all personal preference. I use a thin down to me as sky gray and I have no problems. And uh, Bill Chilstrom recommended that to me and I started using it and I was comfortable with it. But you have to prime them. Usually in a gray color, some guys prefer using black as a primer. It's all personal preference and there are plenty of painting books out there for you to explore that. Next. All right, a little bit of tips on masonry. The only thing I want to share with you that I think is one of the biggest mistakes also is folks think, well, a, a, a wall is a wall. Five or ten, boss. Okay. Ten cool. slides. Ten slides left. Huh? Ten slides left. Ten slides left? Okay. <coughs> I can do it. Come here, see what's up. This, uh, the one thing I want to tell you about masonry is it's never one color. It's just like, you know, the color modulation on the tanks or we do all that you know, that uh, oil paint weathering, you know, where we put all the little dots on it and then we streak it and do all that. You do the same kind of thing with masonry. And uh, Chris's book on building dioramas has a really good tutorial on techniques to do masonry to get a variation of color in what appears to be a uniform color wall. But it's really not. And I don't know how else to explain that. The other thing I will tell you is that walls tend to be dirtier down by the ground. And if you have masonry like a sidewalk or a street, they're going to be far dirtier than the bottom of walls, say of a buildings or what have you. These are little things you have to think about when you're doing your diorama. Next. Anybody see Chuck Dome's work? Holy cow. That's Chuck Dome. That is a model. That is not a photograph. Okay, and if you just Google Chuck Dome, he's a very kind model. He shares all of his techniques out there. You can find him very, very easily on the internet. And I mimic some of his stuff. Notice I said mimic. I can't duplicate, uh, that's for sure. But these doors, for example, on the piece I have, this is a, a door from the piece I have this year. This is actually cardboard. It's cardboard that they give you. And using his techniques, you can very easily with any material uh, replicate or mimic what he's doing. All right, next slide. A second. I need to get that guy to come do a barn door for my wife. Oh yeah? In the house. All right, okay, I'll do that. I can do that. All right, now let's talk about groundwork. I've thrown these couple of slides up here 
But what I'm trying to get at is that, boy, those colors are really off. But what I'm trying to show you here is grass is also not a uniform color, very rarely, unless you're on a golf course, okay? Weeds, especially in the country, grow all over the place. Just look at your front lawns. How many of you guys, you know, we mow and are like, God dang, the dandelions are back and everything else. It's just the same way in dioramas. You're going to see a variety of vegetation. Click, start clicking there, Pete. Just click, keep clicking. First of all, uh, bad grass and vegetation groundwork can really kill a diorama. I've seen some great pieces, and then you look at the groundwork, and you go, whew, boy, that, that is not good. Yeah, stop right there. If grass is not a straight line along a road. I see that a lot in dioramas. That's a common mistake by beginners. Just look at just look at your own driveway. I mean, unless you get out there with an edger, there's always weeds trying to creep over the edge. There's always bare spots in your own grass at home. And we manicure those. So it's even worse in natural fields. So you'll see I've purposely left thin spots and I've made it very irregular along this country road. So that's another tip that you need to think about when you're doing it. Okay. One of the hardest things to do are bushes. This bush right here is actually a wire steel brush dipped in some heavy, heavy glue and then dipped into um, pieces of parsley. And then you pull it out, flip it over, and you got a bush. Cut it off, you're good to go. Couldn't do that with lichen. So. <laughs> <laughs> Kick! All right. The uh, other thing you need to also look at is that grass, you have to think about what season you're doing. And sometimes I get a little stupid about this, I guess because I'm too anal. But like when I did Flowers from Angels, uh, this is the piece right there, and you've got these guys in winter jackets. And I went, ooh, it's kind of getting close to winter. Let's see, the operation was in late August. Would, would roses still be available? out in the French countryside and I actually went and, and Googled it and they said roses will last until the first uh, freeze. So I went, okay, I guess I'm all right. It hasn't, it hasn't frozen yet on the ground. So that's the kind of thing when you put all these elements together, you gotta make sure they work and they're realistic. Now, one of the things I use in this latest diorama, this is a great product and uh, uh, any of you guys know Angel from Micro? He's out there on the floor. He's got this stuff. It's called from the Scenic Factory, and I gotta tell you, it's some of the best groundwork out there. This stuff is amazing. It's a resin, but it looks exactly like mud. As a matter of fact, when I first opened, I said, okay, I've just been ripped off. This is mud. That's what it is. You simply lay it out, you can play with it, put footprints in it, tracks through it, and everything. And after about four or five hours, it's hard as a rock and it's resin. That stuff ain't going anywhere. It ain't chipping, nothing. And it's really good stuff. Not really too cheap, but you can get a jar. There's a jar right there. I'll pass it around. This is the stuff, scenic mud. It uh, smells a little bit, but it's empty. I'll pass it around, and you can take a look at it. One question right here, Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah. Say if you uh, are building a couple small vignettes or dioramas, uh -huh. and you use that, can you? Use it several times once you open it up, or do you have yes. to use it all once? Yes. Make you sure you up? screw it tightly, though. Uh, I will give you a little tip too. Because that stuff's expensive, what I do is I'll put, um, if your preference is cellulose clay, or maybe some of you use Abe's clay shade, I will fill my groundwork almost up, and then I'll put a thin layer of that stuff over the top of it that I need. It'll save you some money, and it'll look great. Promise you, you won't be disappointed with that stuff. <coughs> Next. I'm almost done. All right, let's talk about water. I mentioned this and how scary that was doing water. Before I did this, when Pete asked me, hey, Dave, did you do a test and everything before you did this? Yes, I did. There's my test from 2006 before I did this water. And I wanted to know if I could tint it. And I do it. And I did this in one pouring. Can you do that with resin? Uh-uh. And if I tried to pour resin that thick in there, Holy crap, I would have melted the crap out of those uh, vehicles that are in there, those ducks. So what is it? Next click. Next click. Magic water. Hey, Dave, isn't that dry rubbery? Yes, it does. Okay. But 
who cares? <laughs> you know, you know it, 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 you're absolutely right. Tony's right. It does not dry like a resin will. Now that's from 2006, and you can still feel a little give to it, but it hasn't cracked, it hasn't shattered, it hasn't done anything. Now I've also, on the top of that, I was playing around how I was going to make wake. So I will tell you, to make wake, continue. Uh, oh yeah, it sets in about 24 hours, so you know, and it doesn't creep up the sides like resin here. It does a little bit, but nothing like resin. Man, resin do wants to... It's not supposed to shrink at all. Yeah, and it doesn't shrink. And it's exactly like water when you pour it in. So the other thing I would tell you is, make damn sure that you've got your water area sealed up tight. Because it's worse than resin. If you left a little hole, it will run out that little hole all over your table. So make sure that, in fact, you do this. Now, how did I get this wake right here? Next. Uh, using the, the very small, little, tiny weights you see of Leo still water. Apply it with a brush and run it the way you run your current. For the more heavier current, I use clear silicone caulk like you use in your bathroom. Just put it on, run it, <coughs> trowel it in the, in the direction you want the water to go. I wanted the effect of a streaming stream. Duh. <laughs> And so that's how I did it. And the white wake is nothing more than carefully applying white oil paint in very select spots on the very tips of that caulk. Is very that easy. natural oh, color? That's 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 really nice. Nice. Very good question. <laughs> with this stuff, you can tint it. Matter of fact, this magic water was tinted with a small amount of green acrylic paint uh, before I did it. You don't want to overdo it unless you want a really murky, murky water. This I wanted very clear, like a crystal clear. So I only applied a very little bit of tint to it, a brownish green <coughs> tint when I did this. And you can pour all of that at one time. That was one setting, and it's about that thick. Wow. Boom, done. Next. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did that, okay, next. <coughs> That's when it all comes together. This is my very favorite diorama of all time. Rick Waller did it. It was here at Auburn, if you were here the last time during the show. Time before. Remember I told you that one figure could tell a story? There it is. The absence of figures, the colors, everything about this brings home a very, very powerful, powerful message. And this is also kind of brings all the rules together and home at my conclusion here that he put so much thought into this and he wanted to make sure that he got it correct. Now, I will tell you that I've seen other dioramas and it's a very touchy subject to do that try to show the Holocaust with an entire train and all these people getting off and these Germans with these German shepherds and they're barking at the, at the people and they show the concentration camp gates and they really, and they have this huge piece. That's nice, but I will tell you, I think this says far more than something like that. And he did it with one figure. So if you ask me, this is still my favorite diorama of all time, and probably will be for a long time. Next. Shep Payne, grandfather of our hobby. Remember I told you you could have a story without even having a full figure in it? Check that out. I love that. I mean, and remember that thing I told you about, like you don't need to spell it out? You don't need to spell it out, do you? You've got nothing but, you know, some gear hanging and a female leg sticking up in the air. So, um, maybe that's his wife right now. I don't want to get crude in here right now. I don't know. But, but the beauty of that and the composition of that, the guy's amazing. What, what the idea is he gets in his head. Next. <coughs> There's a guy sitting right back in the room. His name's Chris Morosco. This is Chris and I almost 24 years ago. And Chris has taught me so much. He's incredibly talented. He's been involved uh, from the business end of modeling for years and years and years. And uh, Chris really had taught me a lot. I will tell you that even when I use my figures, there's still elements of Panzer tactics that you did this, what, about 10, 15 years ago, Chris? Oh, no, Longer? Uh, yeah, yeah, 16. Yeah. 16 years ago. I still find this one of the most effective ways to get realistic vehicles without having to buy a whole bunch of, you know, you've got to have this product to do the chipping and everything. Chrissy walks you through on how to do it, and they're absolutely beautiful models that Chris does. 
and uh, and he uh, inherited uh, Shep Payne's building dioramas. So that's certainly saying something. And I would tell you, if you want to know more about dioramas, read Chris's book. He's updated Shep's work and paid amazing tribute to him and brought you up into the 21st century of some of the products and materials that are available there. Plus, he, Chris also walked you through how to do resin casting and things like that. The so, unfortunate thing, Dave, is that diorama was not done when they wanted the photograph for the cover. Yeah. Well, you know, that happens. I hear you. Deadlines, right, dude? But uh, Chris is an amazing guy. And, and I know Chris would be more than happy to talk to you out on the floor if you have questions. Next. Okay, Doug Lee, I mentioned this guy. He's a heck of a nice guy. Uh, this is his book. Uh, I go to this quite a bit. I'll never be at this level without some formal training from somewhere. Uh, he's just a natural artist. Uh, he sculpts all his own horses. I don't know if you notice anything about Doug's horses, but he sculpts the fur into the horse, to the whole horse. It's amazing. I've never seen any horses do that. And they're 35th scale. Uh, this is a piece, this, this kind of was very touching to me. Uh, he actually emailed me and said, David, I love your uh, uh, Tears of the Fancer, Faster Panzer so much that I would like to do a piece like it, but I want to ask your permission first if, if I do it. I said, Doug, you don't need my permission. What are you talking about? He said, I don't want to disrespect you, and I, and I want to do this, this uh, tortoise race, kind of the same theme you had of these soldiers watching the tortoise. And I was just struck by the kindness of him to do that, to just you know ask me that. He didn't have to. I mean, I don't have any rights to that silly diorama I did. But I think that says volumes about um, how we need to treat each other as modelers. You know that we do respect each other's work and we try to help each other as much as we can. Next, <laughs> Greg Chilar. I was kind of hoping maybe Greg might be in the room, but he's not. He's wandering yeah, around the floor in here somewhere. He's one of my heroes. Uh, if you want to see absolutely stunning composition, look at Greg Chilar's work anytime you can. Study it and study it. He's got a piece out there right now, a hind helicopter, you know, the crew. It's a triangle. You will see that triangle appear over and over in Greg Chilar's work. And he thinks about every little detail and executes it to perfection in everything he puts on a diorama. Next. These are some other cool guys, not so much related to dioramas, uh, with Meg's book. We all know him. He's the rock star of the hobby now. Uh, but he's got a section in the back about dioramas. Some of it, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, maybe it's just a European way of the way they look at dioramas. But some of it I found actually very confusing, to be honest. But he is, does amazing work and ult ultimate realism. The same with this cat here. I'm sure a lot of you picked up tank art. There are things that you can use in this book in the layering techniques and chipping to get decay in other things like buildings, pipes, other things in your diorama. So don't just look at this and go, well, I'm not going to learn anything about dioramas out of how to build a tank book. You sure, sure as hell will. There are things like techniques I use on my tanks that I use in other elements of my diorama. And then uh, Lynn Kessler. Uh, this is an older book, but I think he makes some very good, important points about armor dioramas specific to what we do, about doing things realistic. There are things that you can do on your armor model that will kind of kill the realism. And it's things we all know as tank builders, like packs that magically hang on the side of tanks that don't have anything to hang to. Okay? Little simple things like that. Next. My closing thoughts. First of all, yeah. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Bill Murray, okay, he's in the pool with that uh, baby Ruth bar. So here it is. Yeah, your first effort might stink, but here's the deal. We all learn and improve. Enjoy the hobby and enjoy the journey. That's what I'm telling you. We're all in here because we love doing this kind of stuff. It's the only reason we spend all this money and beg our wives to please let us go one more year and do this kind of thing. And husbands too, I see we have a few ladies in here too. So, okay, all right, there you go. And uh, next picture, here's the next thing. One more thing. Never give up. I know so many modelers that I talk to and they'll get to a certain point and they don't want to take that risk. And or they just hit a point 
where they go, you know, and they put it aside and they start something new. And I, I can see it in your faces, some of you are guilty of this. The only way you're gonna get better is to take the risk and do it. And if it doesn't turn out like it should, like John Chervat said at one time, it's only plastic tanks, people. It, it is. It, embrace that as a, an art form and something fun to do, and don't take it quite so serious in that regard. And that's the only way you're going to get better. So next slide. Yeah, where did you get the magic wand? Yeah, okay. Well, 